Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to be talking about uh, judicial decisions and, and algorithms today. And I thought I would start by uh, motivating this talk with, all right, here we go. All right, there we go. The paper I'm sure you all know by uh, Kleinberg et al. about the virtual uh, you know, uh, algorithmic judges. This shows incredible impacts uh, on the efficiency of uh, you know, making bail decisions, uh, all while actually decreasing uh, racial disparities. And this happens in spite of the fact that, that the outcomes in this paper and many others uh, came about from uh, data sets that were trained on that you know, probably had some biases in them. So I'm going to be talking about two papers and two topics today. First is a theoretical model of what mechanisms make this possible for us to actually decrease bias even in spite of uh, bias training data sets, and then also what happens in the real world when judges get uh, algorithmic guidance. So let me begin by talking about the first topic. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the model in this paper, Bias and Productivity, um, is about where should we expect better learning technology to decrease bias. So and you think of this in settings like the paper you just saw, uh, like in the Kleinberg paper, uh, and in others. So I'll just briefly present the intuition of this paper before uh, talking about uh, s some results. <clears throat> uh, so uh, the punchline is that under mild assumptions, uh, machine learning uh, can remove biases, uh, but only if the training decisions are not just biased, but, but also sufficiently noisy. Okay, so, so why is that? Uh, I, I create a model of something that I think is probably pretty obvious. Uh, experimentation and better learning in the form of AI uh, are complementary. And then uh, noisy or inconsistent historical decision making uh, introduces with basically quasi-experimental tr uh, training uh, variation uh, into training data sets. So these noisy decision makers are basically pu putting A-B tests into our training data. And that turns out to be really useful uh, for, for dbi uh, algorithms, even if the overall trend is, uh, is in, you know, on the side of bias. Um, in the context of this conference, we've had a, a paper about bandits. You can think of noise as essentially allowing explore in an explore, explore, uh, exploit uh, setup without having a formal uh, bandit in place. And with enough noise, even simple algorithms can reduce out, uh, bias even without uh, sort of special uh, fairness adjustments. Okay? And so this is true for uh, lots of different types of bias, but uh, you know, um, including both taste-based and statistical discrimination. Uh, so are humans sufficiently noisy? Is this just a theoretical possibility? You may remember uh, from last year, uh, Danny Kahneman came on this stage and said we actually uh, study bias and not enough noise. Uh, actually, most of the errors people make are, according to him, better viewed as, as noise and not bias. Of course, there are uh, lots of evidence in behavioral economics about people uh, making decisions based on the weather or their hunger or, um, uh, or sports events or, or whatever. Um, and, uh, and that has implications for uh, AI. The main implication is that the behavioral noisiness uh, supplies ML with, with, better, with, with, with better training data. And in the paper, I also uh, go on to show that if we have large biases, you only need a small amount of noise in order to uh, detect and correct them. Uh, I also show that uh, settings where we can reduce bias because of all the noise uh, also just destroy traditional goodness of fit measures for machine learning. So uh, you know, Susan has been telling us that uh, metrics are basically incentives. And what this says is that if we give our engineers metrics uh, around goodness of fit, they're going to systematically avoid settings where there's the uh, biggest potential to re reduce bias. And that's because um, you know, the bias reducing ones just inherently have very bad uh, goodness of fit. And then finally, uh, machine learning algorithms, internal weights, have uh, no relationship at all to their treatment effects. And so this may come up in the discussion as well, but here's, here's what I mean. Uh, a common way to think about regulating uh, algorithmic bias is to take a look at the insides, the internal weights or coefficients of an algorithm, and then try to sort of quasi-interpret them. So this is uh, actual data from a paper I have on uh, resume screening and, and machine learning. And it would look to a naive observer like, like um, you know, statistically non-traditional people are uh, hugely screwed. Uh, referred people are getting off really well in this scoring algorithm uh, until we implement the RCT and look at what the effects are compared to a counterfactual. And it turns out the effects are uh, positive for lots of these things, including uh, coefficients that were negative or zero. And then uh, on the referred candidates, there's essentially no treatment effect, uh, even though they got a very strongly positive weight. Uh, so this kind of uh, casts doubt on whether the idea of regulation of bias through uh, you know, policing the internals of algorithms would actually be very effective. Um, so this, you know, summarizing this paper, it has broadly optimistic conclusions uh, that seem to be applicable to judicial decisions. There's a, a host of paper using judicial leniency instruments 
um, showing that which judge you get to get assigned to has a lot to do with you know, whether you go to jail, whether your patent application gets uh, approved or not. In other words, the judicial decisions seem to be really noisy. Okay, so, so what happens in the real world in a uh, criminal uh, pretrial sentencing context? So I'm going to be studying this in the setting of Broward County, Florida, uh, which in fairness is not the same setup as the Kleinberg one, so maybe the, the comparison is not fair. Uh, but what happens in this setting is there's an algorithm that takes 137 different uh, variables and um, spits out a continuous recidivism score uh, shown to the judge in, uh, in buckets of low, medium, high, and also with a decile. So this is a regression discontinuity paper <coughs> uh, looking at uh, what happens to the, uh, you know, how long you're uh, detained pretrial around the decile thresholds and the, the low, medium, high thresholds. And here's what I find. Well, first of all, here's what the uh, distribution of these scores look like. Uh, crossing these thresholds uh, pretty cleanly affects whether you're assigned uh, low, medium, high. I won't go into it, but the typical uh, balance and manipulation checks around these th uh, thresholds uh, you know, don't, don't raise any red flags. And I'll mention uh, three main results coming out of this RD. Uh, first of all, there's an effect of being just right of these thresholds on the order of one to four weeks, depending on exactly which threshold uh, you cross. And uh, this effect mostly comes in how long you stay in jail, uh, conditional on staying on jail over one night, rather than who stays uh, over one night uh, at all. And to put this number in context, uh, you know, if you think about how long you could be uh, away from work before getting in trouble or getting fired, uh, it's an economically meaningful length of time. Most advocacy groups uh, focus on trying to get people out of detention within three days, uh, not uh, one to four weeks. <clears throat> Second, there are heterogeneous effects to crossing these thresholds uh, by race. So black defendants' uh, detention is way more sensitive to these thresholds or these labels um, uh, than whites, even though uh, the label is essentially random around, uh, around, a window, um, you know, uh, around the window of the, the, the cutoff. Um, in some cases, there's almost a double uh, the effect on white defendants as there are on blacks. And uh, there are actually some thresholds where there's no uh, detectable effect on white detention uh, at all. So finally, uh, I find that uh, crossing these thresholds has a small but statistically significant effect on uh, recidivism within two years. Um, and so on the low decile thresholds, these are sort of the least dangerous people according to the algorithm. There's a negative effect. So you're actually slightly less uh, likely to have recidivated um, <coughs> within two years. Uh, this is consistent with the extra jail time being a deterrent. Uh, but for most of the cutoffs and most of the deciles and the uh, low medium cutoff, um, there's an increase of recidivism uh, about uh, on the order of 1%. Uh, so that is, you know, being slightly above versus slightly below uh, increases the probability that you're going to be arrested uh, within the next two years by this uh, small amount. Now, you might think, you know, how is that possible? Uh, so this is not the first paper to show that being in jail a little bit longer increases the chances you'll get in trouble with the law again. Um, and the main avenue is that pretrial detention, according to other papers, including judge leniency papers, uh, shows that this just affects your likelihood of being found guilty when the actual trial comes. Um, also, I want to emphasize that you know, they, uh, recidivism in this literature and in this paper is defined as being arrested. Again, it doesn't mean that you actually did it. Uh, you could be arrested because of greater surveillance, uh, particularly if you, uh, thanks to your case outcome, now have a uh, higher prior arrests and higher prior convictions than you counterfactually would have if you were a little bit below one of these thresholds. Um, all right, so uh, there, there's lots of concern in the area of uh, algorithmic bias about so-called algorithmic feedback loops, uh, which is where you know, we label someone a possible engineer, then an intervention happens thanks to that algorithmic label. They be, become an engineer, but later on that becomes quote unquote ground truth. Um, and there's a bunch of journalistic writing about this to my knowledge, this is the first uh, well-identified evidence of an algorithmic feedback loop. So we have people who got extra jail thanks to the compass algorithm and an arbitrary threshold in how that was implemented. Uh, this led to them being accused of more, of more crime later on. And now these outcomes uh, are being used in literally hundreds of CS publications uh, using this uh, compass data set. So they're using it as ground truth uh, as if it had not been contaminated uh, you know, by the very use of the algorithm uh, that they're sometimes uh, studying. And there's some evidence that this 
you know, contaminated uh, you know, so-called ground truth data, but actually affected by the use of, of Compass, uh, is actually being used in production that is uh, shown to judges uh, you know, in the real world now. Cool. Uh, so you might think this sounds terrible, but I do want to remind everyone that there's no human counterfactual in this data at all. Uh, it could be that an unguided judge would be uh, much worse. Uh, that's just something that, that I can't tell from this experiment, and I think that is hard to, to estimate generally. Uh, so just to conclude, uh, you know, can algorithms improve judicial sentencing? In the, in the, first, the first paper I covered, suggest that there's the theoretical preconditions to think it will. We also have this very promising simulation in empirical work by Kleinberg, Kleinberg et al. Uh, but <clears throat> how this actually works uh, may depend on the level of adoption and also our, as society's, willingness to limit judicial discretion uh, and possibly make them follow a, a, or comply with an algorithm uh, like, the, like the Kleinberg uh, paper uh, even and, and effectively override the judges, um, you know, limiting their, their ability to affect that. Thank you very much.